Ms. Anika, you can hear, you can start. Sure, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, distinguished dignitaries, and the valued audience. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to the inaugural ceremony and the first session of the prestigious Faculty Development Program 2023, conducted by the Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka, in collaboration with MRL Publishing. First and foremost, I'm honored to welcome Professor HMS Priyanath, Acting Vice Chancellor, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. Next, I extend my warmest welcome to Professor Atul Njanapala, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. I bid a warm welcome to Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan, Regional Director, Emerald Publishing, South Asia. With gratitude, let me welcome Professor MSM Aslam, Chairman of the Research and Publication Unit, Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. With great respect, let me also welcome Professor N. Jayanta Devasiri, Chairperson of the FDP, Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. With gratitude, I would like to welcome Ms. Sangeeta Mene, Chairperson of the FDP, representing Emerald Publishing, and Ms. Disha, Disha Lakkanpal, Chief Organizer of the FDP, Emerald Publishing. We are privileged to have Dr. Isuru Kaswatta, Assistant Professor, University of the West of Stock Scotland, as the resource person for session one. Today, he discusses the topic, academic entrepreneurship, the importance of personal branding as an academic. I would like to welcome Ms. Kaushalyani Ruandika, Coordinating Secretary of the FDP, Ms. Dimutu Vicheratna, Assistant Secretary of the FDP, and all the distinguished participants from Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka and Emerald Publishing. In addition to our distinguished guests, we are equally delighted to have valued participants, mainly academics from all the universities worldwide, researchers, corporate managers, and administrative staff from various corners of the world for the remarkable online webinar series. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to all of you and wish you a productive and enlightening faculty development program. Thank you very much and let the event commence. Next, as per the agenda, Professor Jayanta Endevasiri and Ms. Sangeeta Mena, chairpersons of the faculty development program 2023, who provide all the necessary guidance and mentorship in shaping the goals and objectives of this program, deliver an introductory remark to the inaugural ceremony. It's over to you, sir and ma'am. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Professor HMS Priyana, Acting Vice Chancellor of the Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. Professor Atulanyanapal, Dean of the Faculty of Management Studies, Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan, Regional Director, Emerald Publishing, South Asian Region, Professor MSM Aslam, Chairman of the Research and Publication Unit at the Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragama University of Sri Lanka, Dr. Isru Kuswath, uh, who is the resource person for first session, which we are going to deliver today. Ms. Sangeeta Menon, chairperson of the program, Disala Kanpal, the chief organizer of the program, uh, Mrs. Dimutu, and also Ms. Kaushalyani, the members of the organizing team, and scholars who are joining today across the world. It is a great pleasure and honor to discuss an important topic that holds immense significance the research community in the South Asian region. In this rapidly evolving world, 
Yeah, knowledge is the key to progress. It is crucial for academic institutions to post a, a culture of research and its scholarly contribution. Through the implementation of a faculty development program as the third ed edition this year, we aim to empower our academic staff to make meaningful contributions to their respective fields. During 2021 and 2022, we completed two successful programs with the participation of more than 4,000 researchers worldwide, namely the Writing Impactful Research Program and also Research Mentoring Program in 2022. Allow me to introduce the Faculty Development Program, a collaborative effort between our institutions and international experts in the management domain. This program that has been meticulously designed to equip researchers with the necessary skills and knowledge to produce quality research and publications by engaging in a variety of didactic topics. Participants will gain a comprehensive understanding of how to write and publish impactful research across various domain of business and management. The overarching objective of this program that is to enhance the research and publication competencies of academic staff within the South Asian region and beyond. By doing so, we aim to foster a vibrant and intellectually stimulating academic environment that encourage the pursuit of knowledge and the generation of original ideas. Through this program, we identified three key intended learning outcomes that will guide our efforts in empowering our researchers. Firstly, we aim to develop the ability to devise new contributions and promote originality. It is essential for researchers, as we know, to explore uncharted territories, push the boundaries of knowledge, and to propose innovative ideas that can bring about positive change. So by cultivating a mindset of curiosity and encouraging academic staff to think outside the box, so we can create an environment that thrives on intellectual curiosity and innovation. Secondly, we seek to enhance the skills of writing and publishing impactful manuscripts. So the ability to effectively communicate research findings is crucial in ensuring that the knowledge generated reach a wide audience. Lastly, through this program, we aim to empower researchers to become leaders within the scholarly community. By providing them with the necessary tools and resources, we encourage them to actively engage in academic discourse, collaborate with peers, and take on leadership roles. Through their active participation and contributions, they can shape the future of their disciplines and inspire the next generation of researchers. In conclusion, the faculty development program that is an essential initiative that seeks to enhance the research and publication competencies of researchers in the South Asian region and beyond. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Sangeeta Menon, the chairperson from Emeraldin, to elaborate on the course structure of the faculty development program and the way forward. Thank you. It is over to you, Ms. Sangeeta. Thank you, Professor Devasri, for explaining how this FDP is unique and why a program like this is the need of the hour. Hello and a warm welcome to everyone. We wanted to share a brief insight into the program and what to expect from the coming sessions. Our speaker today, Dr. Isru Koswate, is joining us from UK, where he's an assistant professor in business and management, uh, University of the West of Scotland. While Ms. Vijayaratne would be giving a detailed introduction uh, of our speaker today, I wanted to mention today's topic, academic entrepreneurship, the importance of personal branding as an academic, where Dr. Koswate would be talking about attracting the right opportunities as an academic. The next session would shed light on one of the biggest challenges facing researchers, which is how to identify fake, predatory, and clone journals by Dr. Sumit Narula. Dr. Narula, who is the chairman uh, of Center for Detection of Fake News and Dis Disinformation at Am Amity University, has recently launched an app called Amity Quality Journal Checker on both Google Play Store and iOS platform that helps re researchers identify predatory journals. 
Moving on, uh, a big part of the publishing process is peer review. If done correctly, it helps authors strengthen their articles and thus improve the chances of citations and downloads. Our expert, Professor Mohamed Kassir, would be addressing the why and how of reviewing papers in this session, how to conduct an outstanding review. Next, we have a prolific researcher himself with multiple publications in A category journals, Professor Abhishek Behel. He would be talking about how to improve your research profile and addressing platforms like Google Scholar, Publons, Orchid, and Scopus. The session after that would be by me, and I will be sharing publishers' insight on the publishing processes of the top global publishing companies uh, in my session, how to improve article acceptance rate and publish quicker. This session will help researchers have a better understanding of their rights and responsibilities in the publishing process to make smarter choices. The session that follows would address a big challenge that publishers are constantly facing with submissions, that is ethics in publication. We will learn about academic integrity and ethics in publication from Dr. Rasika Priyankara, who recently added to his list of accolades the Most Cited Researcher Award 2022 by the Faculty of Management Studies of Sabargama University of Sri Lanka. The next speaker has over 150 papers published in top journals. Dr. Satish Kumar from Indian Institute of Management, Nagpur, will shed light on how academic networking, uh, shed light on the academic networking and how to expand academic opportunities. And in our next session, in addition to her research on endeavors and editorship in prestigious international journals, Dr. Anugamini Priya Shivasta is actively engaged in training and faculty development programs for faculty members in India and abroad. She will be presenting on how to become an effective editor. Then anyone published, planning to publish a book must attend the session, The Art of Publishing an Academic Book by Professor Payal Kumar. She has not only authored multiple books with top global publishers and is an emerald author, we are proud to say, but more importantly, her book proposals have never been rejected by any publisher. This session would be followed by a session by our very own Professor Jayanta Devasri. He has not only published in top tier journals himself, but has been awarded nationally and internationally for research excellence several times. He will be sharing his insights on how to achieve competitive advantage for a top tier publication. The session would bring a fresh perspective on the challenges most Asian researchers face in publishing in top journals. The next session is by Professor Priyanka Tripathi from Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. She has received several grants from India and UK based funding bodies like Indian Council of Social Science Research, SPARC, which is from Ministry of Education, India, Collaborative Online International Learning, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, among others. She'll be sharing her tips and insights in her session, The Art of Obtaining Research Grants. And for the final session, we'll once again have Dr. Sumit Narula, who is also the editor, chief editor for Journal of Content, Community and Communication, a Scopus Index journal that was indexed without any publisher support. He'll be sharing his tips and advice on how to get your journal indexed in top tier indices. With that, we have come to an end of our session lineup. There would be great takeaways from each session, and we hope everyone has fun learning. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Professor Devasri. Thank you very much for sharing the, uh, the structure of the program, Disa. So it is over to you, Sanika. Thank you very much, sir and ma'am, for like uh, delivering and detail delivering a detailed introductory remark. Thank you very much again. So this momentous webinar series would not have been possible without the guidance and support rented by the chairman of Research and Publication Unit, Faculty of Management Studies. So this kind invitation goes to Professor MSM Aslam to deliver a speech. Sir, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shanika. 
I think uh, I'm audible to everybody, right? Okay. <clears throat> Actually, it's a really great privilege and proud for the research and publications units as well as for the Faculty of Management Studies and Sabargam University of Sri Lanka to launch one of another, uh, you know, important academic empowerment programs and the researchers. Actually, this is uh, why, uh, first of all, I had to thank uh, Vice Chancellor and the Dean and Professor Devasri and all our other academic staff who join us to, you know, launch this program in two, 2023. This is long awaited program from the faculty. We wanted to continue our previous two program to, it's like a self coaching programs. Academics to be empowered because academics to be uh, played a major role in the global sustainable development. So every time the academic to be encouraged and they have to coach by themselves only. Because once we become a scientist or a young scientist, or most of the time research and publications, it's like highly dynamic and turbulent environment we are dealing with our research and publication. So every time the world expects for us to come up with the innovative and creative ideas as we are heading to the fourth industrial revolution or a fifth industrial revolutions. So we demand more innovative and the creative solution for the existing and emerging problems. So therefore, this is one of the things helping academics to bridge the global challenges and meet with their target goals. So therefore, we really thank to Emerald Publication. As usual, we join in many events and many academic uh, empowerment programs. One of the, I think, global institution, which always encourage academic and researchers to move forward. So we had to thank every member here from the Emerald publication for giving us this opportunity and joining us to launch the another program to empower the academy. So therefore, this is going to be a, one of the most useful and uh, very important session for the all the academic who join us from globally uh, to empower themselves and to, uh, you know, overcome the, their research and publication challenges while enhancing or enriching their academic performance to the globe. So therefore, finally, right, all the academic members and including our Vice Chancellor Dean, who is supporting us, thank you very much for giving your fearless cooperation and the supports. And thank you very much today's, especially the today's first, uh, you know, the resource person, uh, Dr. Isuru Koswata, your topic is highly, highly thrilling and in very, very timely, you know, need of the hour of the academic community, the academic entrepreneurship and the importance. So therefore, you are, yeah, you are, it, it's a very, very, you know, uh, you know, privilege and the great uh, honor for us joining you in this forum as a festival starting this kicking uh, the launch in the program. So thank you very much. And I had to thank all the other resource person. I think already Ms. Sangeeta explained and uh, described about our next resource person who are going to take part in our program. So we had to thank all the academics and all these uh, scientists who are going to contribute for this program. Thank you very much. As on behalf of uh, Research and Publication Unit of, uh, Unit of Faculty of Management, in the, I extend our gratitude to all the members and all the supporters for this program. Thank you very much. Tanika. Thank you. Yes, sir. thank you very much, sir, for like uh, providing the necessary guidance and support always to the development of research in the uh, faculty as well. So, thanks. This faculty development program 2023 would not have been possible without his outstanding leadership and great thinking in providing a platform for nurturing talented faculty members and the research fraternity. 
So this cordial invitation goes to Professor Atula Janapala, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka, to share his thoughts with the gathering. Thank you very much, Sanika. Hi, Boa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear respective academics, those who participate in this program across the globe represent more than 50 countries. It gives me great pleasure and honor to address this prestigious gathering at the inauguration session of the Faculty Development Program. Professor HMS Piyanath, the Acting Vice Chancellor of the Sabarajan of Sri Lanka, Mr. Sundar Radhakrishna, Regional Director of South Asia, Emerald Publishing, Professor MSF Aslam, Chairman of the Research and Publication Unit of the Faculty, Professor Jayanta in Devasiri and Ms. Sangeeta Menon, founding chair of this program. The resource panel including Dr. Isuru Paswatka, the resource person for the first session of this program. Organizing team including Ms. Disa Laknampal, chief organizer of this program, and Ms. Sanika Ratnasiri, Ms. Dimutu, and Ms. Kausalani. Professors, academic and researchers, dear ladies and gentlemen. Today, I connect with you virtually as the Dean of the Faculty of Management Studies of the Supreme University of Sri Lanka. Then uh, I wish to express my utmost enthusiasm and unwavering support for the forthcoming Faculty Development Program. It brings me great pleasure and honor to emphasize the vital role of this program. I believe this program helped to enhance the research and publication competencies of our esteemed academics, scholars, and researchers. As an academic institution, we have recognized our profound significance of research and scholarly contribution, since it is the only way we can contribute to the advancement of knowledge for the betterment of this society. Therefore, I must emphasize the potential value of this faculty development program as it equipped with our academic and scholars with the necessary research skills and competencies to make original and impactful contribution to their respective field and facilitate the publication of influential manuscripts. The networking and collaborative work are the remarkable aspect of this faculty development program. I believe it is the secret of our success. We believe we have taken great care to ensure that this faculty Europe program provides ample opportunities for engagement with international ex experts in the management domain and renowned publisher on board like the prestigious MRL Publishing. Doing so, the faculty development program fosters a global perspective encouraging academic networking that transcend borders and enrich our understanding of the world. Moreover, I wish to express my deep appreciation for the program adaptability and inclusivity. Understanding the diverse needs and circumstances of our faculty, we have designed the program to offer both virtual and physical mode of delivery. This flexibility ensures accessibility for our academic scholars and researchers from different part of the globe, enabling them to make the most of this invaluable opportunity to enhance their academic and professional competency. In conclusion, I wholeheartedly encourage every one of our esteemed faculty members to actively participate in the faculty development program. Doing so, it lays the, the foundation for research excellence within the faculty of the management studies and beyond. Let us seize this moment to embrace knowledge, engage in transformative experiences, and unlock the boundless potential that lies within each of us. Thank you all for your attention, and I eagerly look forward to witnessing the positive impact of this program 
on our academic community. Together, let us embark on this journey of growth and excellence. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much for your great leadership and the inspiring words you delivered here. Today, we are indeed honored to have the online presence of Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan, Regional Director, Emerald Publishing, South Asia. We, the Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka, highly appreciate your support in making this collaboration a success. So it's over to you to address the live audience. Uh, thank you, Mr. Masiri. Uh, hi, Buan, and a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us here today. At Emerald Publishing, uh, we've always looked for ways to support uh, the researchers in ways that go beyond publishing an article. Uh, being a responsible business, it's at the heart of everything that Emerald Publishing does. We believe in taking responsibility and working collaboratively with our partners, communities, and colleagues to make a positive impact uh, on a local and a global scale. Hence, it give me, gives me immense pleasure to be at the third webinar series in collaboration with the Sabargamo University of Sri Lanka. The past series have seen tremendous attendance for each session uh, and the positive feedback that has been heartening uh, as well to receive. Hence, this third series is, is, is even more significant for us and this collaboration is very, very important to us. However, we recognize that in, uh, in a scenario, it's important for more participation, bigger, bigger acceptance to people all over the world joining us again. The past series, as I said, have seen tremendous uh, attendance in, in, the, in, the, in the past. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the advisory board, the members of Sabargamo University of Sri Lanka, Senior Professor Uday Ratnaki, the Vice Chancellor, uh, the Acting Vice Chancellor, who has also joined us today, uh, Professor Atul Nyanapala, the Dean of FMS, Professor MSM Aslam, Chairperson of the Publications Unit of FMS, for the un unconditional support towards all programs that we have collaborated with uh, the FMS and the Sabragamo University of Sri Lanka. My special thanks to the Emerald Brand Ambassador for South Asia and the main force behind this unique faculty development program, uh, Professor Jayanta Devasiri from the Faculty of Management Studies, Sabragamo University of Sri Lanka as well. Research that has real world impact goes beyond citation counts. and It's, it's about communities joining together to find solutions that result in positive change. In past programs, our focus has been with individual researchers. However, we recognize that in many cases, there are discrepancies in the understanding of research and publication process between the academic staff and the scholars on publishing because of constantly evolving landscape in the publishing scenario itself. This time, we are aiming to enhance the research and publication competencies of the academic staff in South Asian region to bridge these gaps. We hope that the series helps all device new contribu contributions and original manuscripts that lead to impactful research being published. More so, our hope that we are able to join the jointly efforts and direct others to help shape the research culture in your respective institutes, in your respective countries, in your capacities. I'm thrilled to mention that this year's program is being conducted in collaboration with international experts in the area of management who will equip participants with the necessary skills and knowledge to produce quality research in various businesses and management domains. My sincere thanks to all experts in advance for taking their time out and sharing the knowledge with the participants here. Based on the past webinar series, the expectations are very high from us, from both the teams at Sabragamo University and Emerald Publishing are eager to meet those expectations. The FDP was developed after months of planning and coordination. We really appreciate the, that despite the challenging economic situation currently in Sri Lanka, the team at the Sabragamo University have been conducting the program with the same enthusiasm and rigor as always. I wish the organizers the best for a smooth running of yet another successful series. I'm sure the audience members will have some great takeaways after each session, and we at Emerald look forward to being part of your journey ever. Stuti. Thank you very much, sir. Next, while expressing my sincere gratitude for your presence here, I would be privileged to invite Professor 
HMS Priyanath, the acting vice chancellor of Sabarakamu University of Sri Lanka, to address the gathering. Thank you, Shanika. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, Mr. Sundar Rajakrishnan, Regional Director, South Asia MRR Publishing. Professor Atula Nyalapal, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, Sapragam University of Sri Lanka. Uh, Professor MSM Aslam, Chairman of the Research and Publication Unit, Faculty of Management Studies. Professor Deva Sirian Jayanta and Ms. Sangita Mena. Founding developers of the program. The resource person, resource panel, including Dr. Isuru Koswat, the resource person of the of this first session. Organizing team, including Mr. Vishal Lakan Paul, chief organizer of the faculty development program, and Ms. Chanika Ratnasir, secretary of the program. Uh, deans uh, and heads of the faculties, professors, academics, scholars, uh, representing more than 50 countries today. It is a great pleasure to express my wholehearted support for the faculty development program. This program uh, holds a paramount role in enriching the research and publication competencies among our esteemed academia in South Asia and beyond. In the pursuit of uh, academic excellence, research and scholarly contributions play an important part. We firmly believe in, in the importance of fostering an environment where originality thrives, impactful manuscripts are published and our faculty members emerge as leaders in the scholarly community. To achieve this, it is vital to equip our dedicated educators with the necessary tools and resources. To all faculty members from academic institutions in South Asia, uh, South Asian region, I extend a heart -left, heartfelt encouragement to actively participate in this program. Together, we can elevate our research and publication competencies to unprecedented heights. Further, our university's uh, commitment to reach uh, the research excellence and the advancement of knowledge. Last but not least, I appreciate the visionary leadership of uh, Senior Professor Uday Ratnayaka, the Vice Chancellor of the Sapargama University of Sri Lanka, in guiding our university's young researchers for collaborative object, uh, projects with, uh, that will be beneficial for academic community in the long run. Let us embrace uh, this opportunity, uh, embrace uh, the spirit of collaboration, and together let us take our scholarly community to new heights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. thank you very much for accepting our sudden invitation and joining us today. Then it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Dimutu Vijayarappa, Assistant Secretary to the FDP 2023, to introduce the resource person of session one to the valued audience. Over to you, Ms. Dimutu.
Miss Dimutu, you are on mute. Can you all hear me now? Yes, yes, I, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Good evening, all. It's my pleasure to introduce the resource person of Faculty Development Program Session 1, Dr. Isarukasa. Seminar at the University of Dandy. He is part of the Social Impact Leadership and Management Group at University of the West of Scotland and specialized in organizational resilience, entrepreneurship, and business sustainability. He has published several international works on resilience building and is presently engaged with active international collaborative research, including funded projects. He was recently awarded and is a recipient of the prestigious University of the West of Scotland Vice Chancellor's Studentship 2023 for his project on the topic of the role of leadership in building resilience toward sustainable economic growth, a Scottish SME perspective. He is also the deputy program leader for the BA Business Degree Program and a committee member for the Staff Research Forum at University of the West of Scotland. He completed his PhD from the University of Manchester in 2020 at the age of 27 and is skilled in mixed method research, structure equation modeling and qualitative research. He was also part of the Nordic Research School of International Business, which offered several doctoral courses in international businesses at seven business schools in the northern European countries, including Alto University Finland, BI Norwegian Business School Norway, Copenhagen Business School Denmark, Leeds University UK, University of Gothenburg Sweden, University of Manchester UK, and Uppsala University Sweden. He is recognized as a fellow of the Higher Education Academy for his commitment to professionalism in learning and teaching in higher education. He is part of the network, the European Consortium on Applied Research and Professional Education. Dr. Koswata is an associate member of the National Center for Resilience, a cross-sector partnership spanning Scottish universities, government, and practice. He is also a member of the British Academy Early Career Research Network in Scotland, as well as a member of Academic of International Business, AIB. Before University of West, uh, West of Scotland, he was the head of research at NSBM Green University in Sri Lanka. His teaching com comprises a range of fields of business and uh, management, including module leadership in business process, organizational performance of MNEs, and organization in society and research method. Dear sir, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimuthu, for that very generous um, introduction. Uh, I discussed with him, but he told me he's a doctor. Can I have a little Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, loud and clear. Yes, yes we can. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Acting Vice Chancellor, sir, and again, um, Professor Atulun Yanapala, thank you very much. And again, special thanks to Professor Devasiri for inviting me for this prestigious occasion. Um, also, special thanks to Ms. Sangeetha and the Emerald team. Uh, I'm really humbled and honored to be in the company of um, this esteemed panel and also welcoming every one of you who have joined internationally for our session. Um, I hope uh, Disha is in the background um, helping with the presentation. Um, just to double check. Perfect. Thank you very much, Disha. Right. So um, again, just to give you a brief introduction, uh, how this topic came about. Again, um, this was something I personally was quite passionate about. Again, just to give some brief for you, as um, Dimitri mentioned, I do come from a an academic background but again i would call myself an entrepreneur as well because i have a family business that is running in sri lanka um, an entrepreneurial business so there was this uh, very interesting uh, balance where i obviously 
am an academic but also i come from a business side of things as well and we always and as management scholars we talk about entrepreneurship as a subject where we teach entrepreneurs but on the hindsight do we actually use some of those concepts as academics to really showcase some of the work that we are doing and taking it across so that's where this topic came about you would have heard about this topic but i'm going to give it my own twist uh, with some of these inputs that i've gained uh, again i have um, been in the uk for over 10 years and obviously with my experience in sri lanka and also working in the uk i think uh, we will be able to use some of those learning outcomes especially in a south asian context where some of the things could be developed uh, disha can we go to the next slide Right, so the session overview is I'm going to give you a brief understanding of what branding is and also run through some of the common misconceptions that we have when it comes to academic entrepreneurship or personal branding per se. Um, we are then going to run into um, various avenues for personal branding and the most important component is where I'm going to introduce you to three main components as academics that we already are engaging in and how to utilize these three concepts in a way where we, we can establish ourselves and work towards a sustainable career building progress. Um, and finally, we'll obviously open the floor up for uh, questions and answers, um, I think the last half an hour or so. Right, so uh, next slide, Disha. Right, so branding. Now, branding is something I think uh, quite universal to a lot of you. Uh, again, I know most of you are academics here, but we've got some people from the industry as well. So brand is what we call a unique identity, uh, something that is pretty distinct that we can always identify. And if you look at this picture, you would realize or recognize some of these household names or household brands uh, that are there. And branding, on the other hand, is how we can really give this power to these almost stagnant or um, uh, things that are out of life, some kind of life and some kind of uh, a passion. Now, if you look at a brand like Nike, um, I, I assume one of the first things that comes to your mind is athletics or sports. Or if you look like a brand, something like Apple or Louis Vuitton, they talk about quality or um, in the case of Louis Vuitton, it's about um, luxury and sort of aesthetic value. So these are things that we associate with the brand without even thinking because that's how the brand has been established that's how the features or that's how some of the utilities of these brands or the personas have been communicated to the public eye and the main important thing that we can realize is as soon as we see one of these brands all those value addition proportions that make up this brand comes to our mind and this is where these brands have been sustainable and been iconic for the longest time so the idea behind this is again could we really apply this uh, this concept to us being academics to create what we call a unique brand for each and every individual now this might sound a little far-fetched or a little confusing at this point in time but hear me out and you might be able to maybe gather a few things as we go along next slide disha i think you have to press it again Right. So again, when we talk about um, branding, one of the common misconceptions that we have is that, especially when you talk about personal brandings for an individual, uh, there is a lot of misconceptions surrounding that we are talking about the individual or we trying to showcase to the world that we are the person. I would like to use that term, but that's not what we're trying to say. We are not trying to say that we are the only available solution for each and every problem as an academic. Now, as an academic, we all know that we are expected to deliver when it comes to problems. Now, again, if I was to take an example in Sri Lanka, obviously the cost of living crisis, and we know that after the pandemic in Sri Lanka, there was an economic crisis. And as academics, you are expected to give real life solutions. You might be able to give solutions to certain problems, but not all solutions can simply come from one individual. So that's something that we need to understand with this process, Adisha, if you could press that again, I think we'll complete the full slide. Uh, what we can see is that we are not trying to say that we are the only solution. That's something we need to understand. So why is branding so important in this world? Again, according to statistics, we can say branding is critical to growth. Now that's something we all know. 
and branding is one way in which we can distinguish ourselves from the rest of the market again if i was to go back to that first example where i showed you some iconic brands the brands themselves speak out for them why because they have some unique characteristics that allows them to stand on their own and compete against different other brands and still stand out so that is what makes you unique now one thing that we all need to acknowledge is that again as academics who are in an academic career uh, most of you have completed your phds most of you are in the process of completing your phds which is a fantastic achievement that's something that you should not underestimate however one thing you need to understand is that as much as we are working towards this unique research culture as much as you are establishing a unique research culture as individuals this output is increasing um, tremendously in the world and that's where we have to start looking at this idea of what we mean by academic entrepreneurship so let's look at what um, uh, very theoretically what we can really see academic entrepreneurship means now again if we was to take uh, one of the references from 2004 the traditional perspective of academic entrepreneurship talks about how an institution could transfer some of their research development and start again applying it to the industry so we are talking this at a very larger scale however the sort of definition have sort of uh, moved on to somewhere where we are talking about the academic institution again from an institutional perspective how it could really tackle some of the problems that are in the society so that's where we start thinking about okay do we have the capacity to work with the society do we have solutions to the community problems that are perceived and that are there so could we really bridge this gap is where this idea of academic entrepreneurship comes but i think in terms of the idea that i'm trying to put forward one of the closest definitions that i could find was from campbell and gutel 2005 where we are trying to see that the academic entrepreneur is identified as what we call the academic and then we are able to sort of bridge this gap with knowledge and sort of provide a solution to a real life scenario Disha, we can go to the next slide so again an academic entrepreneur i would personally uh, name them or i would person define them as an individual or somebody with a niche expertise again as an academic that's where we stand however we are slightly different from the typical academic mindset where we have this strong desire to use this expertise to make a difference in the world again i would like to quote uh, from one of the esteemed panel uh, mentions previously it's not simply citations per se but do our work really make a transformation in the world can we really give tangible outputs through our research is where academic entrepreneurship starts to deviate from the traditional understanding of being an academic and again they are able to really sort of resonate i would say with what is happening in the real life and again use their expertise match it with what is happening in the real life and provide uh, an influence and this influence i would say goes beyond the academic institution that you are operating so it's quite an interesting concept and you can see that there is a lot of spillover going into sort of other areas or other areas outside your academic um, immediate academic surroundings and i think that is the expectation uh, of a modern day academic and again i think that's where as an industry uh, if you look at especially from the western context things have moved on and i think in a, in a south asian context i think that's where academics should start thinking uh, more on that side of things as well so that's where we are slowly sort of trying to reach into this uh, and tap into this idea um, as we go along and again if we are to take and uh, take a look at some of the statistics again um, yes addition next slide uh, so you can clearly see that the number of phd outputs uh, worldwide have been increasing again if i was to go back to this idea doing a phd in itself is a differentiation strategy for you yes you have something unique to yourself you are quite obviously out there in the world to be known as a respectable individual however you need to understand on a global scale phd outputs are increasing so we would assume most of these phd outputs will come into academia so the number of academics or number of phd qualified individuals are going up quite uh, significantly now although phd outputs are going up significantly one of the problems that we can see is that 
especially with the COVID uh, pandemic and also the other transformations happening in the world, I think it's universal to say that we see that, again, similar to many other industries, academic jobs as well as academic prospects have been um, in, in the quite um, negative mind frame in terms of growth. Again, there are significant job cuts and more importantly, I think the most important thing to realize is that funding has become uh, very difficult and quite tough to really navigate through. And this is, again, we could obviously look at this as a challenge, but again, if you are to wear this hat of an academic entrepreneur, now an entrepreneur is an individual who is able to look at a problem and obviously flip the coin and see this problem as an opportunity. So I would assume an academic entrepreneur is an individual who realizes where the market is heading, where the market that you're working in heading is. So on one side, we have the PhD outputs or the, the, the individuals who are coming into academia going up. But on the other hand, we have the funding and other opportunities scholars and researchers have in terms of applying for grants and applying for other funding reducing. So it's quite a volatile environment that we're dealing with. So this gives us uh, the very more reason, I would say, to start thinking about, yes, having a PhD is fantastic as academics, but can we go beyond that? Can we go beyond our PhD understanding and stand out as an academic to deliver to the world, world's problems? And this is where I think we, we can now slowly start to see this need coming in. Okay, so if there's a need, where do we start? So, and this is where I, the idea of the personal branding, Bishop, we can go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Uh, the idea of personal branding um, comes in handy. So again, if we look at how academics have been evolved in the world, again, if you look at you as an individual, uh, your professional identity would be largely determined by the academic level that you are. So you would start from a lecturer and you would go up to a professor, senior professor, and that is your role in your respective department. However, if you are to wear this hat of an academic entrepreneur, you would always start thinking big from the beginning. How can you start reaching these audiences? Again, as I said, academics are expected to deliver on impact. So again, the translation of the academic role, unfortunately, again, the things have changed slowly, but if you really look at it from the industry, this is something I've experienced personally. Again, because I'm an entrepreneur, I work with industry actively. There's a significant gap when it comes to academia and what is expected from the industry. So again, when fresh uh, graduates come into industry, there is a lot of uh, problems surrounding what are their no, I mean, knowledge sources that they're tapping into and what is the industry expecting. So clearly there seems to be this big mismatch. Either it's a problem with the industry not understanding what has been taught or the academics have not really updated in terms of the work that is happening in the world. So how do we really start to bridge this gap becomes tremendously important because that is where I think the impact and the actual spillover and the actual uh, benefits to society starts to really kick in. And this is extremely important because again, I know that most of the audience here are academics. However, when you go outside, there is still this um, almost a misconception, I would say, that people think that when you have a PhD or when you are an academic, that you are quite distant from what is really happening in the real world, or you are unable to really translate some of those learnings that you gain out of very extensive research work to practical outputs and practical implementation. And this, this is where I, I saw this um, article uh, by The Economist, which I found uh, quite fascinating, although it might be on a negative tone where they're saying a PhD is a waste of time. What this article actually talks about is that how you need to really start thinking about delivering to the industry and you need to start believing that you are an individual who is actually going to give solutions to the real life problems. So start thinking big um, as soon as you start your career it really helps you to really mold yourself um, in terms of personal branding. Right, so I, I hope I have managed to give you uh, some sort of a picture where this topic is heading. But the most important thing I think as an academic that you might be thinking is that, okay, it's very nice and elaborate for me to come and tell you uh, what is personal branding and talk about some of these marketing perspectives. But how can this really be translated 
into your immediate workspace and this is where i was personally thinking about uh, what are the core elements that we all go through as academics and how we can really utilize these three main areas that i want to talk about today and use that as a strategy to push ourselves in terms of delivering some of these outputs and again as the first session of the fdp uh, i know the entire program is revolving around research and enterprise but i want to tap into these other two core elements that we all go through that in most cases we think uh, are quite cumbersome but how we can really use that for our benefit so again seeing all these arrows go around the main reason behind this is that i personally believe that there is a solid um, sort of interdependency and interrelationship between these factors and if we are able to really understand how each and every component of these three core, core elements relate to i think that's where we could really harness all our sort of uh, energy i would say as an academic to really deliver the outputs that we are of in terms of full potential so we are going to talk about uh, teaching and professional development to start off with and then uh, we are going to obviously uh, go into a, a bit of um, sort of academic leadership and also finally we are going to also go into research and enterprise and um, so this is how we will sort of structure so let's first start off by looking at teaching and professional development now as academics uh, teaching um, is something that we are already engaging in and one of the things that i find quite fascinating is how much teaching as a role have has evolved in the past couple of years, obviously, uh, ironically, thanks to the pandemic and the changes. Obviously, most of the changes were forced changes, the online presence and all of that. But the most important thing that we need to understand as academics, as you start your career, is for you to work on developing yourself as a teacher. As much as you go out there to teach uh, students or the future of our generations you need to develop yourself as a teacher or as a lecturer as well so this is where i think you need to first start thinking what are the avenues in which you could develop your teacher training so i know that especially many institutions including uh, sabragamu and also uh, bodies like emerald have been instrumental in helping regional as well as local development for academia and you can also start looking at how you could gain worldwide exposure so this is where i'll be again talking about some of the personal experiences i've been through again bodies such as the hea academy are again based in the uk the fellowship training program have really opened me personally uh, as an academic in terms of how we can really deliver uh, as a lecturer in our progress so an academic would start off at an associate fellow level where you come with the lowest level of experience and then you would obviously go up the ladder into levels such as a principal fellow based on your experience and the most important element here why i think this is important for you to engage in both local and if possible in international level teacher training is that you are then able to compare yourself to the international standards and the international expectations of an academic personally me running through some of the peer reviewing and understanding some of the changes that were happening in academia really helped me to understand how things have changed so that's i would say a very big starting point for all of us as academics to start thinking early as possible in terms of teacher training and secondly we have something called we call cpd training so again continuous professional development again this is also similar to the teacher training but it goes slightly beyond that where we, we are working on other skills that are expected as lecturers and teachers to have again um, bodies such as um, the united nations working with uh, sort of the, the governments and local countries now the south asian center for teaching development is something that i've seen quite um, actively engaging so these are sort of training programs that keeps you on your toes in terms of understanding what are the changes that are happening in terms of the learning space and this is transformative because as academics if we are not really understanding where teaching as a role has evolved we we, we won't be able to really deliver on the other outputs as we go along and again you start off with following some of the teaching teacher training following some of the local courses to international level and then you can even go to a step beyond where the third uh, sort of area that i wanted to discuss was on uh, disha we can go to the next one is about you actively as a lecturer 
attending some of the teaching conferences both in-house and external again i will use an example that i've gone through again at uws we have something called the annual teaching conference again this is where they bring in academics obviously internally from different divisions different uh, units and also some externals where we are able to really have an environment to start discussing about how academic roles have changed in the past couple of years again a, a really uh, interesting article that i saw in the times is about this idea of the active lecture again the student centric learning mechanisms how we need to really start thinking about these things as we evolve as an academic and also you could start looking at other things such as publishing again we are now slowly coming to research but i've kept this onto teaching and development because i believe this is part of teaching and development where you are actively using some of those learnings that you've gained in your classroom discussing it with peers discussing it with other colleagues through conference attending for teacher training specifically and if you can go to a step beyond start publishing in education related work because again this helps you to develop yourself as a lecturer and again inherently help you brand yourself as an academic because i think the most important thing as academics is as much as we learn about teaching if we can really use our experiences and share some of those thoughts with other academics who are th going through the same journey and start sort of publishing on this line of work it really helps you to develop yourself uh, as a lecturer teaching side of things specifically so that's the first sort of element i wanted you to uh, really tap into and the second most important element um, i have, have named it as academic leadership but you could also put uh, administrative roles here now again from what i've heard so far this is not something a lot of people enjoy when it comes to academic work but it, it is a very important element that i think every every individual who is in academia should try to strive to achieve now remember this is not about you uh, becoming uh, or getting a very top position in the organization as you start off because that's not how things work but it is simply about the mindset remember we are talking about how we start thinking as an academic entrepreneur so how do you take responsibility and could you go beyond your immediate role as an academic but look for opportunities that are available and build your capacity yeah, it, it's very very much easy for you to obviously do the tasks that you are given simply stick with that but are you able to take on some additional responsibilities and go beyond that is the most important element here so again if i was to give you an example how do we start this process one of the first ways as an early career researcher or as an early career and academic you can start is start playing an active role in module and curriculum development again you could easily speak to your line manager or your department head uh, about where you come from now for example each and every one of you uh, will have your own background now again as i said i come from an international business background uh, resilience building so i personally was very much interested at start of my career uh, looking at modules such as strategic management and international business make sure you communicate these messages very clearly to your organization or uh, your sort of line of authority very clearly and uh, it's very important that you start attending some of these what we call a program reflection sessions again i'm sure that you will have something very similar at your uh, institutions where it really helps you to connect with other senior academics um, in the field and sort of start discussing about what were the learning outcomes that they gain. Again, uh, one of the first programs, again, when I joined UWS, I attended was this MSc International Business Program where it was almost like a, a retreat where we have all the academics who were part of this module joining in and we then start discussing about what went right, what went wrong and sort of getting each an individual person's reflections and it's quite fascinating um, for example uh, there was one instance when they were discussing about again most of the students who come into these modules come from south asia and you you are trained to be uh, or taught in a way where there's a lot more sort of i would say spoon feeding happens at the very in, very beginning of your let's say undergraduate degrees or programs whereas in the western context most students are expected to start doing things quite independently so as somebody from sri lanka i was able to really give some of those homegrown solutions that we apply 
and I was not even part of this module at the very beginning. It was quite refreshing for that panel to really hear my side of the story because again, it would really resonate with the actual students in that um, sort of unit or the cohort. So this is where I think you can really give your sort of thoughts. Uh, it's a very open kind of platform where I think, so I think that is a very good starting point for many academics who are looking to look for certain roles. You don't have to, um, again, be appointed for those things. If there are opportunities for you to attend some of these reflections, some of these sort of open forums with other academics who are in the field, you, you should definitely um, go out there and attend some of those programs. And, and secondly, I think uh, another important element uh, when we talk about academic leadership, um, Tisha, we can go to the next one. Uh, is about you trying to understand what are the sort of training and development programs that you have internally. Uh, now, again, I think every university has its own sort of program. Now, at UWS, we have something called the Staff, Re Staff Forum for Research, which is um, sort of a, a weekly program that we have um, internal senior academics uh, delivering on, on different things, such as the research that they presented to things such as in vivo training to um, different methodological training, etc. So it, it's a very sort of uh, a comfortable space for you as an academic to start really discussing your work, start sharing your thoughts in terms of where you stand as an academic, what kind of learnings that you've gained, and also uh, use that as a platform for you to come and present. So that's where, again, I started my work here. And again, for 2023, 2024, I'll be working as a chair because, again, why you could actively start working in these things and slowly find yourself gaining certain responsibilities. So again, as I said, you start off internally looking at in-house opportunities, and then you slowly start developing your confidence in terms of your capabilities. And, and the third most important element as we come to this branding story is about research and enterprise. And I know that we have an extremely esteemed panel uh, in, the, in the next couple of months to discuss this, but I'll be discussing some of the early learnings that I have gained, which you might find useful as we go along. So one of the first things that I uh, think you, you need to start thinking of um, as soon as you start your sort of career as an academic is to uh, decide how you want to really uh, embark on your PhD work and sort of disperse this work in a, in a professional or in a, in, a, in a very strategic way. And this is where I think things such as developing a research career plan becomes very important where you are able to now slowly understand where your research stands and which kind of targets and which kind of elements that you want to really tap into. And again, being an academic, you'll have to be very reasonable in terms of all that other workload. So that is why I was bringing in, for example, things such as administration as well as teaching. I know in most cases, when you start off your academic career, there's a lot of teaching that is involved um, so it might be quite challenging for you to have a lot of outputs planned in the first couple of years but having what we call a research career plan really helps you to understand which of your goals that are important and slowly develop a plan as we go along and again most importantly from the very beginning start understanding where you are where do you want to be specialized in again as i said you are an expert as soon as you are finishing your phd but the most important thing is how are you going to take that work that you did for your PhD and disperse it in, in that sort of specialization area. And then once you are clear on that role, I, I think the, the next most important step, according to uh, my personal experience, is where you start looking at your department or your unit um, in terms of the university and seeing which areas in, of research that the university is specialized in different universities have their own core areas that they like to focus on and you need to really see what work that they have done in this and how it really relates to you now personally again at uws we have a number of research units and i i am working with what we call siilm which is focusing on leadership and management as a core so that's very important for you to really start thinking where your institution is doing research in and how you could start aligning your research to the needs of the institution, especially to that research center going forward. And I, I think one of the unique selling points for this, if you can, again, if you don't have this, I, I would really encourage for you to establish this setup where we call, we establish a research mentorship program where when you have a new academic member joining your faculty or your department, you would have 
them first have a meeting with what we call the research head or, or a possible research head if you have a couple of research centers and this research head would then be able to align you with what we call a, a research mentor now a research mentor doesn't necessarily have to be always a senior academic because every institution might not have that luxury to have so many academic members but it could be somebody who's already engaged in that particular research center who will be able to give you some guidance in terms of how you could start thinking of your personal research aligning with the research centers research in a way so that that will be a very uh, nice beginning for you to start contributing more actively to the institutional needs and also trying to understand how your research could be uh, taken out to the world through your institution so i think i think it's a very interesting concept that um, I think most universities in South Asia would benefit if you are able to really uh, develop this process. And I'm sure most universities have something quite similar to this already uh, in the progress. So once this, I would say, once this platform is established for research and enterprise, I think then you could obviously start thinking of the more um, larger issues. Uh, Disho, we can go to the next one, where we start thinking of how we want to publish our work and again, I'm sure you will be getting uh, more knowledge on this. So I'm going to briefly touch on this, but start thinking of where you want to publish your work. Now, again, um, in the case of the UK, uh, you might know, you might not know, we have what we call the REF, which happens every seven years where the, the government assesses every university's research and research assessment happens for academics on what we call um, the sort of chartered association of business schools ranking or the CABS ranking where academics are expected to publish articles above three stars so this, this is a very high level of an expectation and i know how daunting this could be for starting but again to reach this level again as an academic you need to start building a platform so start working on indexed article publications to a starting point and that is where you could again use the benefits of having a research mentor not simply to tell you what to do, but also guide you in terms of areas where you need development so that you are able to reach some of those high level targets as we go along. So it's, it's a very systematic plan that you do. And I think the research sort of um, what we call uh, having a research career plan really helps this because you will then know, okay, where you stand currently and by what time you are able to really deliver let's say a three-star publication or a four-star publication in a realistic way because you've got that plan in your system and you have got the support system to ensure that you build your capacity to reach that level as you build your academic career so that's very important now beyond these sort of obvious points uh, for research and enterprise i want you to um, maybe pay more attention to some of these points that i'm discussing because I think this is where I think you can then start adding value uh, than your usual outputs. So again, you then go out there and start thinking of who, you are, who are your experts when it comes to your field of work. Again, I'll be talking about a little bit of my work, which is on resilience building or crisis management. And one of the things that I benefited through this setup that I just explained to you was that I was able to really see how my PhD research was able to smoothly translate into some of the more pressing issues happening or, or at a wider level for example business resilience i was able to expand it to things such as entrepreneurial resilience and crisis management so that was a natural progression thanks to the setup i just explained so i think that's something you will be able to also experience once you have this setup established for yourself okay and the important thing for you to understand is that you don't really have to have all these different units established in your institution you could go out there and do this for yourself through the resources that you have that's the other thing i want to explain and then you start thinking of okay who are your external bodies that are doing similar work to you but maybe not at an academic level but at different levels now for example uh, national center for resilience again this is uh, this is a scottish uh, we would say uh, an NGO, but more of a semi-government institution that is working with the government um, of Scotland as well as the United Kingdom, where they are actually bringing in scholars and practitioners who are researching, working on resilience building and sort of connecting with, with the industry. So it's a very unique sort of experience. And, and I think that is where I think you should start going out there proactively looking for these units because they really help you to tap into some of those societal problems that you might not be able to identify from your own scope if you are to 
look at it from look at it from a very scholarly perspective so that's where the connection i would say or the bridging of the gap could happen and again you can also then start thinking of once you are comfortable in your own space of research start thinking of whether there is room for interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary research i will be stressing on this in the next couple of slides but it's very important that you start thinking of this how can your research be related in other fields again whether it's for me a bit of a i'm a bit of a lucky person in a sense because i work on resilience which is very multidisciplinary but that doesn't mean that you cannot really expand your work to other fields so that is where you need to start speaking to maybe individuals who are from other institutions or even from other bodies such as you know the center that i explained where you are able to maybe get a very fresh perspective on the issues that you are addressing but from a whole different subject knowledge or a specialization so i think that's very important now again a program that we have internally what we call the crucible program uh, which is an exceptional program where they teach us on sort of research development and research leadership again uh, this is something um, you can start developing internally with different resource units as we go along. It's very important we start thinking on these steps uh, as you build your career. And, and once these sort of steps are in your way, once you can see how things have slowly moved on to, you can then start thinking of whether you are at a position to form certain regional and international teams. Now, again, if you look at, as I said in the beginning, um, funding is becoming quite a daunting task not to say it's impossible but it's becoming quite competitive in most fields and if you look at how the funding has changed in the past couple of years there's a lot of funding now providing uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research as well as establishment of what we call uh, research consortiums or units of research which brings in different strengths harnessing different capabilities of different individuals so it, it, it's something the, the sort of grant applications or the funding agencies have moved on to and as academics i think this is where we need to start thinking proactively whether we are at a level where we can now start expanding our personal research or our own research whether it's from the institution or from the department to match into some of those wider organizations or wider international level problems in this way now again a program that we have recently that i was part of is what we call the carp which is that european consortium for applied research where we bring in seven different universities from uh, the european units and we start discussing some of the problems again targeting at what we call the horizon european funding again it's one of the biggest fundings available in the region now for example these projects also bring in teams from different units whether it's from uh, asia south asia so you bring in so you could still start working on these areas with your extended network if you are able to really understand some of these problems and really tackle them so the key message here I, I hope you can see how we have now slowly moved from that individual unit to much of a wider space is for you to first start thinking of where you stand as an individual researcher so it goes simply beyond that and then you can slowly start expanding this understanding into wider networks and wider bodies of research. So this knowledge exchange and synergies between colleagues from internal as well as external um, institutions to maybe tackle similar problems, but from different lenses, I think plays a key role in, in sort of establishing yourself as an academic, as well as for your progression, especially in the research and enterprise field of things, because that's where I think uh, the industry or the dynamics of the academic world from my experience is changing. And you could also start thinking of um, maybe establishing some projects. Now, research projects, again, I will use some of these experiences because I was previously the head of research at NSBM and I still work as a uh, senior adjunct at NSBM, is where you can start providing training and guidance. Again, you can establish teams and it doesn't mean that all these teams need to have very high level of academic knowledge. You can have academics, industry, and even students who are part of these projects where you can help them start developing their careers as well as you are benefiting out of some of these projects as you go along so it's all about start discussing and then slowly establishing some of these research partnerships and projects establishments and then developing some of these workshops and research mentorship programs to mold junior academics and others in the pipeline so that at the end of the day you are developing different individuals at different levels so if you are if you are 
uh, mid to senior level academic, you are obviously benefiting from that international level academic collaborations, applying for funding at different other institutions or different levels. If you are an early career researcher, you are benefiting from the exposure that you're gaining from senior academics. If you are still a PhD student, again, you are benefiting from some of the publishing opportunities. If you are even at a lower level, you will still benefit from some of the workshops and the research mentoring programs that you have so that in the future you are encouraged to engage in some of these activities as you go along. So at different levels, you could really tap into some of these knowledge enterprises. And again, I spoke about research and enterprise, and I think enterprise activities is the, the, the other component that plays a vital role, I think, in terms of how you brand. Again, is about how you are able to identify some of those key partners and industries that are important for a pipeline. I think one of the things, again, personally for me has been very useful is working with the Chamber of Commerce. Now, Chamber of Commerce, I took this example because it's a universal example that we can all tap into. So if you can work with your local Chamber of Commerce, identify who your key industry partners who are important for you in terms of your research, then you can slowly start looking at how you can evolve some of those work potentially establish some of these projects. Now, for example, uh, as you may have heard, so one of the PhD studentship pro projects that I have received recently, uh, using some of my industry uh, connections, again, in Scotland, we were able to maybe, you know, arrange a few internship programs for the PhD students. So those are things I think you can go out there and do. And again, it, it, there's no sort of right or wrong way in which how you can do things. You just have to go out there, speak to people, uh, attend some of these industry fair events and then sort of start discussing some of the potentials where you can do certain things and I think this is where things such as knowledge exchange partnerships where you can establish with institutions outside academic academia where you can work on certain win-win proposals and plans as we go along. So there's a lot of work in that way that you can also do uh, which is again part of your research component and again exposure to industry as an academic from an early stage not only helps you to gain visibility in your field as somebody who's engaging in research but also helps you to really identify uh, be a bit more of a i would say a first comer in terms of identifying some of those problems that are emerging in the industry and be one of those first comers in terms of academia to really tap into those problems and provide solutions so you are able to really establish a, a usp for yourself if you are able to be proactive in this space. So uh, I, I hope that you are able to really um, gain something out of it. And then uh, finally, I want to say, obviously we have to be very present and updated and I cannot stress how important it is for you to have your work updated. Again, universities will have their own systems. Now, for example, we have the PO uh, profiles, which is part of Elsevier. Uh, again, it, it's a very comprehensive system, but in South Asia, I think different universities have their own systems. You might have your internal system, but make sure your academic work is being established. Uh, your work is present and updated. And again, using bodies such as LinkedIn, even Twitter, building conversations with colleagues uh, is extremely important in this day and age. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. I hope you were able to gather uh, uh, something useful today. I hope I have kept myself uh, under the time limit. I usually uh, try to go a little under time so that we are able to finish things on time. But yes, uh, I think the floor will be open now for any questions that you might have. So please uh, feel free to ask anything that you have and I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you very much. We, we definitely have a few questions. Let me just organize. Just I also request the audience to please put uh, as many questions as you have in the in the in the chat or in the questions tab, please. Okay. So the first question is, what's my why? how much importance it carries in personal branding yeah i, I think that's, that's that's a good question i think personal branding um, adds a lot of value in this day and age because one of the things that we see as academics is that we are not visible enough i think i think there are a lot of um, academics who are doing tremendous work but unfortunately um, those 
um, solutions or those works only translate inside the academic sphere of things. I, th I think there's a lot more potential if that work could be, I use the word spillover, industry and other bodies. And that is where I think personal branding comes into play because you might have individuals who want these solutions, but unfortunately they don't have the platform and they don't have the ability to connect with you. Uh, as simple as it sounds, so I, I think that's where you need to really start thinking of how you can position yourself. As I said, don't misunderstand this to be that you know it all. It's simply about um, authentically uh, showcasing the work that you've been doing and again offering a helping hand to maybe find solutions to some of those problems that are emerging. So I hope that answers the question. I uh, honestly, uh, everything that you mentioned, I don't. I think it not only applies to uh, the academic sphere, it also applies to everybody. You know, like us also. It was very interesting to hear very intricate uh, points uh, through the uh, through the presentation. Now, the second question is, in the race of competitive edge, how ethical branding is seen and ignored? Yeah, I, I that, that, that's, that relates to not just academia, I think ethical branding, again, as an academic, I think we'll be discussing on even things such as predatory journals and so forth. So I think it's very important that you understand that this is not an overnight achievement as an academic. Uh, being an academic is, I think, being of academia, I think personally, my, my mantra is that you have to first have the passion. I would say don't go behind promotions as controversial as this might sound just be true to yourself what are you trying to achieve as an academic are you really passionate in that work that you're doing and let that really guide you so i think if you are able to do that you are always able to have i would say a sixth sense to know not to fall into or fall into the trap of finding shortcuts for your career development but really work on those the three elements that i said about will that on your level at a sustainable level and then that will obviously get you to places where you want to but don't uh, i would say force it uh, at the very beginning through short and other mechanisms right the the next thing is we have two questions from the same person so i will will try and join in and say uh, i think they are a, a post doctorate uh, fellow because they're saying that are there any suggestions for post doctorate fellows that's the first part of the question the second is that they are working on sem analysis is there any guidance uh, we are working on different technology acceptance models teacher satisfactions learning and outcomes so if you want me to repeat any part, I can do that. But any suggestions for a post-doctoral uh, fellow, that's one. And anything specific on SEM analysis? Post-doctoral fellow, I think that's one of the first things a lot of people take on. Uh, but personally, uh, I think it's, it's a good opportunity. But I would say from that point, if you can really start thinking about not just being postdoctoral but whether you want to find academia as a career long -term career i think you need to start thinking of that at a very early stage because one of the things from my personal experience is that postdoctoral fellowship could really uh, run out of steam after some time and then you'll be at a position where you are really uncertain because you seem to be maybe lacking behind other things if others are able to maybe join academia straight away after a phd so it'll be a bit of a sort of a, I would say, uh, uh, situation where you might want to avoid at an early stage. So be very clear. I would, I would personally, again, I also had the opportunity as soon as I finished my PhD to do a postdoctoral, but uh, I sort of uh, developed my capacity a little bit more to take on an actual academic role because I felt that would be a bit more sustainable. But again, by all means, if you have a postdoctoral get on it but i think you need to start thinking on that next step quite early as possible and uh, i think the second question i think you can just repeat that disha if you don't mind yes the second question is we want to listen on s EM analysis, uh, please guide, guide us. We are working on different technology acceptance models, teacher satisfaction, learning outcomes and performances. 
Right. So uh, I assume this is uh, from a research perspective. So if that is what you are attending, again, you have to start thinking of whether that really lands you on a sort of a, I would say, a research fellowship position in that sense. Or but if you're thinking of more of an teaching perspective, again, I think that work would be useful to work on even a fellowship program. So I, I think that will be something um, probably you could develop on. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether I was able to really answer that, but uh, I think the panel might be able to put in something uh, if that's the case. But I, I think, yes, that will be a good position if you are looking for, I would say, a research fellowship to start off with. Would anyone else from the panel like to take the question? Uh, we can move on to the next one if, if you want. That's okay. The person has actually left the meeting, so they might not be able to hear the answer also. <laughs> Uh, I have a, uh, uh, there's a uh, upcoming uh, question. I think it's really, really interesting. Uh, it, the, the question is, is personal branding possible through publishing papers in journals or conferences? Very, very interesting question. So, I mean, I would take it this way. Now, recently I went to this AIB conference in Glasgow University. Now, I might wear my entrepreneurship hat here. Now, if you look at this from a very academic perspective, you could obviously publish in journals. Yes, that's where the value addition is. But trust me, when you go to some of these conferences, the people that you meet, I mean, taking simply out of the publication of the conference or journal, I think that problem, we know that publishing in journals is there's more value addition. But simply the, the sort of human side of things, the sort of networking, the connections that you build through these conferences, I think, Second to none. So I, I would uh, take it in that way. So be quite smart. So if you are thinking of personal branding, I think I would uh, go for the second option. If you are attending some of these conferences, I think it's very useful because you are not only going there for presenting your work, but you are actually informally discussing some of the developments, um, some of the ways in which the field has changed, some of the opportunities that have emerged. So I think that input you cannot really gain through other means. So I think it's something I would encourage. Um, at any place or at any point in your career to actively engage in. Uh, may I add a little bit to that? Because uh, we oh, talk sorry. a lot about, uh, you know, the use of using social media to promote your own work. And it goes aligns with that a lot because what we sometimes underestimate is connections that we build, people that we interact with, you know, and they are the biggest audiences sometimes. And also the people from whom you get the biggest opportunities perhaps biggest collaborations and that can not be met in any other way uh, as effectively so uh, great answer dr isru we, we completely agree on that uh, you know the importance of conferences and networking thank you ms angita there are there was a question on structural equation modeling isn't it sorry there was a question on structural equation modeling, SEM. Oh. Yes, the question is only they said that um, if someone is working on SEM modeling, they just wanted guidance on how they can take it forward. They are working on multiple uh, teachers, uh, something to do with the teaching and outcomes coming out of that. So that is what they asked for. I can share the question with you later if you want. We can get back to them. We can answer to them because uh, apparently they've left the meeting. They're no longer there. We can cover up also. So we will look forward to it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going through so many of, of these comments. So there, there are at least uh, at least 10 to 15 people who've come back and said that the in the, the session is really amazing and uh, they've really taken back points from today's session. I'm actually trying to find out the questions between the wonderful comments that we've also received. That's why I'm taking a little bit of time. Uh, I don't know uh, how the, the next question is, but uh, the, the, the person has said that uh, it was a wonderful session and they said that did you mention that a phd uh, the research that you do should contribute towards the society and they'd like to know how your phd or your research has made a contribution to society 
question. So again, my research uh, was about sort of resilience building and how sort of spirituality plays a role. Um, so I have been uh, working with a few sort of government bodies as well. I think it was quite lucky for me because when I started my PhD, obviously COVID was not in the loom. And by the time I finished my PhD, you know, surprise, surprise, everyone's talking about <laughs> resilience building and things like that. So I, I think it was a bit of a, um, I would say a little, um, I was lucky in that way because I was obviously able to take my work and it was not necessarily that I had to go out there and market it as much as maybe some other work because it obviously came as a natural progression. But I think in terms of impact, I think it's a very debatable story because if I was to look, look at this from an academic point of view, I think impact is mostly to do with again where we publish the highest quality work and engaging in that level as an academic if you want to build. But however, if I was to wear a bit of an entrepreneurial hat, I think that's where you can really tap into uh, the policy making and some of the changes that are really happening in the world. Um, for example, we, we were able to do this study uh, post PhD when I was at NSBM as head of research where we went out there during the pandemic. Uh, we were able to, um, in fact, do around 1000 interviews where we spoke to uh, people, especially after the first vaccination program, how they felt um, in, in terms of whether they were happy with the sort of governance capacities, whether they're happy with the sort of steps taken by the government, as well as as individuals, how resilient they were throughout the process. So it's quite really, I mean, it's quite fascinating to see how the actual work from a thesis really translates to some of the actual problems. And I was, as I said, quite lucky because that transformation happened quite smoothly uh, in an ironic way because it was the pandemic and everyone was going through a crisis. Um, in that way. So I think that's where you can start thinking, um, applying your work um, at institutional levels. Again, uh, this is very subjective because my work really relates to institutional and policy making, but different people's work could relate to different ways. And I think one of the things you can do is establishing that network outside academia so that you can immediately see how your work really translates societal level and find direct access to some of those problems and solutions that way because translating some of those academic learnings to actual implementation I think there's a big process there's a big learning curve however you could really change that if you really dive into that industry needs first of all and then come back and sort of almost reverse engineer some of those findings and see where solutions lie so that, that's a bit of a process I would say but nothing's impossible Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> next few questions are really, really nice. Um, as an academician, we are always looked at as people who do not have industry knowledge. Then it becomes a huge barrier when we wish to connect with someone from the industry to learn from those people who are working in that field. How can we navigate through this situation? Uh, question, because I, I went through the same problem. I mean, uh, by the time I finished my PhD, I was again 27. So it's not like you have like in a lot of experience coming in. I mean, it's quite next to impossible. However, it's about the conversations you have. I mean, you are not. I, mean, I think the important thing for you to understand is that you need to play for your strength. You come from an academic background and you are bringing in some of those learnings from academia and you are connecting with the industry because the industry needs that side of the learning as well. As much as you think that you don't have the industry experience, the industry people needs the learnings from academia as well. So it's a bit of a reciprocal process, I would say. So it's simply about how you really go out there and express yourself. You have to be a bit, I would say, I mean, you have to go out there and speak about your work. You should be able to really translate your learnings in a very practical sense. And that's where I think even conferences, as Ms. Sangeeta mentioned, or even informal events and things, you get a platform to speak about your work, you start off with it. So that's where I think the industry connects. So it's not necessarily about them not acknowledging you. I think there's, there's a bit of a mis mismatch there where I think that conversation will clear things up. Uh, I think that's where things, I, I would say things would change. I would like to add just one line. You need to be resilient here because uh, writing to people, getting in touch, maybe out of 50, one person responds. And then is how you start that one conversation that leads you to get in touch with more people in the future. So it's about, you know, it's about being, um, how do you say, the 
like you you have to have your goal in front of you and you need to move forward by thinking what are the ways where you can connect you know however simple or big they are uh, getting to conferences where you get to talk to such people you know there are a lot of corporate conferences that come up as well so i think there are opportunities that you need to find where you will be able to talk even if it's like one person out of so many people that you're trying to connect with so um, yeah uh hopefully uh, you know more opportunities uh, in the future uh, I, i think there's one more question uh, and uh, and i i think another really important thing that we need to talk about uh, now we've talked about personal branding so this person says that uh, for instance if we use linkedin to share our achievements research collaborations uh, you know and so often it comes off as boasting or exaggerating uh, you know what is your opinion uh, how do people take this yeah i mean it, it's again about uh, i mean as i said in that uh, very uh, I, i was thinking when i should put that superman i mean it, it just to be very clear it's not it's, it's about i think the fine line about how you really come across um, i think you don't want to be this very forceful or narcissistic kind of mentality but it's simply about again what do we really expect as academics we are expected to do research and we are expected to sort of really disperse this knowledge so i mean there there's no harm i think there's a lot of learning there so i i think you shouldn't be worried too much about it uh, I, i think uh, i mean wherever it is i mean you will have one or two people will always think in that way so you can't change i mean that's how human nature is unfortunately that's a different conversation but it, it's simply about how you really have to go out there and really speak about your work because as in as an academic i think personally everyone has a social responsibility if you're an academic because you are here to teach i mean tell the world about some of your findings and learnings it's not to be hidden some kind of you know vault for only for you to and a few others to see so i think that's an open platform i think if you are thinking of how open research and open access is changing i think you've got a platform already so why not utilize it to the fullest potential i think this is saying which might relate to what you're saying and it goes like you know it's not enough to be just hard working you have to be seen working hard so uh, in this <laughs> is the time where uh, you know being visible become it's what is going to set you apart from your peers and i like i said you have to sometimes attract opportunities towards you rather than chasing them and uh, yeah like you mentioned it's a very thin uh, you know thin line between narcissistic post and one which is actually informing others and we'll have to find that balance very sure we start over to you this yes another question <clears throat> uh the, the next question is sorry one second and um, right uh so i took a break from my mba teaching due to health reasons i belong to the hrm area i have been publishing to stay current and employable to an academic entrepreneur is it necessary to be employed in an university or college right that's a, that's a very uh, good question i would say i mean i think one of the things uh, when it comes to i mean publishing and being in academia that helps you is that you are always up to date with what is happening in industry or what is happening in academia per se uh, I, i i mean personally i had the same issue because i come from an as i said i have my own family business i call myself an entrepreneur because I, we have our business running but then i'm an academic as well so which is quite interesting so it's about i think you have to really tap into your passion you have to think about where you want to spend if publishing and that is something you are really passionate about i think you should go for it it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in academia i know there are so many academics who uh, are not the biggest fan of teaching and administrative work but they love research uh, so i think that's where i think even being uh, like a research fellow helps you where you are free from maybe some of those other cumbersome duties i would use that word but you know engage only in research in that sense so i think it's about not necessarily being in academia but you finding a way to be in touch with that research um, line of work uh, as much as you want to so yeah wonderful an expression is somewhat similar uh, they saying can i be an independent academic entrepreneur uh, if so uh, what are what should would be my activities and responsibilities <clears throat> yeah I, 
I think you can. I think you can now. If if you let's say if you are in a situation where you run your own business, but you are finding yourself with an academic or a research background, you can still be involved in many projects. I think that there is there is ample opportunities for you to be in part of different research projects. But again, I think all that uh, you'll have to be. Uh, a bit more proactive because you need to find those networks that are not necessarily in your immediate background. Now, if you look at academics, obviously we have academics from similar fields. You meet academics when you go for conferences and other things. So you can still attend these things, but you'll have to make an active effort to be in touch and be more relevant with those industries. So I think that there's definitely potential. Uh, next question is, I have uh, someone, what entrepreneurship would mean to a doctoral student from literary studies? So I think, again, it's it's about, I think, looking at the issues and sort of finding solutions. As I said, I mean, being an academic this day and age, I mean, as I said, um, we know that how things have changed. I mean, back were the days where having a degree was good enough. I mean things have changed now unfortunately having a phd i mean th that's how the world is it's, it's becoming a bit more complex and obviously competitive so i think as academics who are in the field of entrepreneurship and i use this word even strategic management you'll have to use some of those learnings of entrepreneurship to your own self and see okay uh, these are problems that we have in the industry okay lack of funding there's not enough opportunities for you to do things so, uh, do you are you keep seeing those as problems or are you going to go out there and change that into a solution so i think that's where the learning should be translated uh to your i mean to yourself in, in a way, weird way um but i think that's where you'll have to basically stay one step ahead of the game or ahead of the curve uh in that way because i think the situations are simply just going to be you know going to get more complex and i don't see this as a problem personally because i think that's where things should be um, and uh, it's just about whether you are proactive enough or whether you are able to keep up with that pace uh, becomes the question. So I think that's where change should happen and you should change as a person as well. Um, we have one question. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's debatable uh, because this would be helpful in various points of someone's career. But uh, someone says that at one point, collaboration is really useful and helpful to write a good paper. On the other hand, many institutions and universities during interviews ask for publications by single authors. You know, uh, whether they also ask what is the position of your authorship, you know, whether you're a second author, or a third author, or a fourth, fourth author. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, a bit of a I would say uh, context specific issue. Uh, however, I think um, you have to still, I mean, collaborations per se, I mean, collaborations just for the sake of it doesn't make any sense. That's where I think I'll go back to my presentation where I said, first of all, you need to identify what are the learnings that you got from your PhD and how well does that translate into the projects that you are actively doing? I mean, I've got into situations where I've been invited for different projects which are which have no real relevance to my area but yes i can get my name on a publication so, as i said is that what you need or are you actually looking to really build your scope in a way where you are slowly becoming an expert in a particular area i think that's the starting and if you are able to really stick to this plan i think you will be able to really work on that and then projects will come in a way where you are actually doing projects that make sense uh, i've got into situations where I've got myself into a project and I was able to change that entire project to fit into, I mean, at least to uh, most of my areas because I want, I mean, I, I I have made a promise to myself to do projects that make sense. Again, it's not to say that I'm, I'm taking over <laughs> different projects, but you know, you'll have to have your voice heard inside the project. I, otherwise, I, I don't really see it making long term progress for you. Maybe yes, short term, it might get you some points, but long term, it'll uh, not really sit um, well in the field yeah disha adding to what uh, dr isuru koswata said so uh, i would like to make a correction to the question raised actually so now nowadays the university they do not focus on sole author research the reason is that we believe that collaborations so that is the way forward to the future 
So if you consider one plus one, it is not equal to two, it is more than two. Through collaborations, you can have different set of expertise, even not only from the context you are representing, but also from um, different contexts like developed markets, underdeveloped markets, and also different disciplines. So you could have uh, uh, more synergistic effort when you make collaboration. So now universities, they are focusing on collaborated research than sole authored research. So that will make a very big contribution towards your study as well. Thank you, Professor Dev, sir. I think uh, that's the uh, a gist of all the questions that we had received, more or less. I'm just, because there are so many, <clears throat> Sorry, one second. I'm just going to open your presentation for one second because there's so many people who are uh, requesting for your um, uh, for your details to get in touch with you. Can I share your yes. last slide that, that has your? Please, yes. yes, because I'll just share it so that everybody can take a quick. Uh, one second. For anybody who is uh, wanting to get in touch with uh, I'm just going to share my screen, sorry. It just took a second for me to organize this. Uh, if, uh, for anybody who wants to, uh, uh, you know, get in touch with, uh, uh, you know, our speaker today, please, can you scan this? Uh, can you scan this? Uh, you know, his, this is his LinkedIn account. You can get in touch with him here. You know, discuss about any other questions that have been left or any any other information that you might want. Uh, I'm sure he's looking forward to uh, you know feedback on the session, insight, any insights that you might have on the research as well. Um, given that. If I can just request Ms. Shanika to take the session forward. Thank you, Deja. Am I audible enough? Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. Uh, sir, for shedding some light on the importance of personal branding as an academic, which is of utmost importance in enhancing academic integrity, reputation, and excellence that is beneficial for institutions and researchers worldwide. So thank you very much again. And also, I would like to thank Ms. Disha for handling the Q&A session nicely. So, uh, moving to the final item in the agenda, may I kindly invite Ms. Kaushalyani Ruandika, the Coordinating Secretary of the FDP, to deliver the word of thanks. Over to you. Thank you, Ms. Shanika. Hope I'm audible. Yes, yes. Yes, you are Okay. So, distinguished guests and respected participants, it's with great pleasure and deep gratitude that I stand before you today virtually to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaratham University of Sri Lanka, in collaboration with Emerald Publishing, for the successful completion of the inaugural ceremony and the first session of the Faculty Development Program 2023. So first and foremost, I extend my sincere gratitude to Senior Professor RMUSK Ratnayaka, Vice Chancellor, Sabaratham University of Sri Lanka. Dear sir, your visionary leadership, unwavering support and commitment to academic excellence have been instrumental in shaping this program and providing a platform for the professional growth of our faculty members and the research fraternity. So we are truly grateful for your guidance and encouragement, sir. Next, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Professor HMS Priyanath, Acting Vice Chancellor, Sabragam University of Sri Lanka, for your continuous support and dedicated efforts. Dear sir, your active involvement and commitment have been invaluable. We appreciate your guidance and leadership, which have significantly contributed to the success of this faculty development program 2023. 
Next, Mr. Sundar Radhakrishnan, Regional Director of Emerald Publishing, South Asia. We are truly honored and grateful to have had your presence and involvement throughout this program. Your unwavering commitment to advancing scholarly research and promoting academic excellence has been instrumental in the success of this collaboration. Yes, sir, your continuous guidance and support have empowered us to successfully conclude the first session of the Faculty Development Program 2023. So thank you so much, sir. Next, I would also like to express my deepest appreciation to Professor Atulasi Nyanapala, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, Sabaragam University of Sri Lanka. Your relentless efforts in conceptualizing and organizing this program have been remarkable. Your dedication to fostering a culture of continuous learning and innovation within our faculty and beyond is truly commendable. Thank you so much, sir. Next, also, I would like to record my heartfelt thanks to Professor MSM Maslam, Chairman of Research and Publication Unit, Faculty of Management Studies, Abaragam University of Sri Lanka, for the unwavering guidance and expertise extended to make this program a great success. Thank you so much, sir. Next, I also express my sincere appreciation to Professor Njan Tadeo City, Chairperson for the Faculty Development Program 2023, Faculty of Management Studies, whose visionary approach and dedication played a pivotal role in initiating this program. Dear sir, your guidance and mentorship have been instrumental in shaping the goals and objectives of this faculty development program. We are truly grateful for your unwavering support and valuable contribution. Thank you so much, sir. A special word of thanks goes to Ms. Sangeeta Menon, Chairperson for the Faculty Development Program 2023, Emerald Publishing, and Ms. Disha Lakhanpal, Chief Organizer of Faculty Development Program 2023, Emerald Publishing, for their collaboration in organizing this remarkable event. Dear ma'am, your commitment to promoting scholarly ex excellence and fostering intellectual growth has made a significant impact on the development of our faculty members as well as the research community of the South Asian region. We are truly grateful for your partnership and the resources you have provided throughout this journey. Thank you so much, dear ma'am. My deepest gratitude also goes to the organizing committee, particularly to Ms. Shanika Ratnasiri, Program Secretary, Faculty Development Program 2023, and Ms. Dimitri Vijayaratna, Assistant Secretary, Faculty Development Program 2023, who meticulously planned and executed every aspect of this faculty development program. Your true talent efforts, attention to detail, and dedication have ensured the seamless coordination and smooth functioning of this event. So you have created an environment where knowledge sharing and collaborative learning flourish. So thank you so much, dear Ms. Further, I would like to extend my profound gratitude to Dr. Isuru Koswatsa, Associate Professor in Business and Management, the University of the West of Scotland, the first resource person of this program for sharing your valuable knowledge and expertise in such an engaging and insightful manner. Dear sir, your session has set a strong foundation for the rest of the sessions that I believe, and it will be inspiring to our participants also to explore the new horizons and enhance their research and publication competencies. So thank you very much, sir, for your invaluable expertise and knowledge shared today. Similarly, a special note of appreciation is due to our esteemed participants. Your active participation, enthusiasm, and eagerness to learn have contributed to the vibrant and intellectually stimulating environment of this program. So your commitment to enhance your research and publication competencies is truly commendable. Further, I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the designing team, administrative staff, and technical support team who work tirelessly behind the, scene, behind the scenes to ensure the smooth operation of this program. So your dedication, hard work, and attention to detail have been the key of this event's success. Thank you so much. Last but not the least, I would also like to express my sincere appreciation to our exclusive media partner, Lakehouse Public Publishers, owned by Associated 
newspaper Ceylon Limited. Your support and collaboration have been invaluable in ensuring the successful completion of the promotion and coverage of this faculty development program 2023. We are immensely grateful for the platform that you have provided to disseminate information and engage in a wider audience, both within and beyond our university community. So thank you so much. So in conclusion, uh, the first session of the faculty development program 2023 has been a transformative experience providing the research community with, in, with the necessary knowledge, skills and an inspiration to excel their roles as educators and researchers. I express my sincere gratitude to everyone who has contributed to this endeavor and have make it a remarkable success. So once again, thank you all for your presence and unwavering support. May the spirit of continuous learning and collaboration continue to guide us in our quest for excellence. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaushal. So this is the end of today's session. Hope to meet you all in the second session on 22nd August 2023 at 12.30 p.m. via the GoToWebinar platform, which will be delivered by Professor Subit Narula on how to identify fake, predatory, or the clone journals. Please kindly note that the same joining link can be used for all the sessions in future as well. So thank you very much uh, for joining us and have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. bye.